Today, I begin by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which I stand and am hosting from today. In the spirit of reconciliation, NEABPD Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. My name is Belinda and I will be your host today. I work and volunteer for NEABPD Australia on the admin side of things, and I'm also a trained Family Connections leader. As you all may know, NEABPD Australia is a not-for-profit organisation. We deliver programs, webinars and events to support families, carers and people in a relationship with someone with BPD and or BPD traits, whether there is a formal diagnosis or not. Our main offering is the Family Connections Program, which is a free evidence-based 12-week program delivering psychoeducation, skills training and support for people who are caring for or in relationship with someone who has BPD. Today, we are so grateful for another presentation from one of our wonderful volunteer leaders, Jenny Fitzharding. Jenny is a cl clinical counsellor, a DBT therapist and a Family Connections leader. She has been leading Family Connections groups since 2015 and Lifeline's DBT teen groups, which is Dialectical Behavioural Therapy for Adolescents and Their Parents, since 2020. Thank you, Jenny, for making time for us and our audience. Welcome. You're on mute, Jenny. <laughs> I don't know when I got muted there. Oh. I'm just trying to drag these notifications to one side. Um, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Uh, it, you know, Zoom does drop in and out, so um, just do my best with that and try and keep projecting. <laughs> um, and just acknowledging that I'm on Wajak Noongar country, which is Perth, and uh, to um, also want to acknowledge the elders past, present and future. So um, thanks very much for uh, coming along tonight. I hope to give you an overview of, you know, uh, one of the very important uh, skills of DBT. How can I turn off these notifications? I wonder. <laughs> Driving me mad. Um, I'll, I'll manage them for you. It's just because you're a host. I'm I'll not... manage them all and admit all of the people as they're arriving right in my line of sight that's the only thing that's annoying oh it's okay we can um certainly accept this all right so um yeah i'm just gonna yes we have acknowledged that so i just want to ask you to actually just take a moment before we really get started today and um just tune in with yourself how are you feeling right now um if you're comfortable you might want to um just sort of sit back in your chair and close your eyes if not just let something go out of focus and just do a little bit of an emotional check-in you might want to notice what sort of things you're thinking you might want to notice any body sensations i can notice that my stomach is turning a little bit because i'm always nervous at the beginning of something like this and I would label that as anxiety. You might notice that you're still distracted from the rush to get here. You might have some other things coming up, like hope or frustration. Just noticing what is kind of traveling through your body, traveling through your mind, coming up for you in this moment. I'm just sitting with that, I'm not fighting it, just naming it, I'm not judging it, I'm not even getting that attached to it, just noticing what, what is happening to you right in this moment. I 
Okay, so just bringing ourselves back to the presentation part of the day now. Um, that was just a little introduction to a mindfulness um, exercise that we might do in a little bit more detail, typically in a DBT class, especially once we get to the point of um, uh, the emotion regulation unit. So I'm just going to keep going. So I know I realise that some of you may know what DBT is, but just for those of you that don't, I'm just going to smash through a quick definition here. So what is DBT? The D stands for dialectical. It is a philosophy that assumes fund fundamental truths about reality, one being that everything is connected to everything else, that change is constant and inevitable, uh, and that two opposites, when considered together, can create a new truth and a new way of viewing things. And this was developed for the, B the BPD cohort, for the, for, for the cohort of people that get treated with DBT, because they do tend to get very polarised. And in families where there is a lot of emotional dysregulation, we can also get really polarised. I'm the rational one, you're the emotional one. So this is the dialectical thing is about looking at, okay, well, there might be some a rational point of view, definitely, and but there could be some truth in this emotional point of view as well. And how do we bring them together and get a bigger truth? How can we uh, both love someone and maybe even hate them a little bit at the same time? That is a dialectical stance. We might hate what people are doing and yet love them, you know, to the point of, you know, would die for them kind of thing. Okay. Jenny, there's a few people that are saying your audio needs to be um, increased, please. Um, I don't know how to do that. <clears throat> okay, I'll just, I've moved. Sorry, I don't know if that will help. And I'll try and, is that better? It seems a bit better to me, yeah. She nods and I, I've got you, I, I have faces in my, I haven't got all the faces, but um, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll, I'm not going to look at the chat because I'll get too distracted then. That's but it's, fine. Thank you. I'll manage that. Um, okay, so yeah, basically, and one of the dialect, one of the main dialectics of DBT is that we need to accept ourselves and that we need to accept our situations. And that when we accept things that we move away from, um, we, we still have pain, but we move away from suffering. And also that we need to change. So um, Marsha Linehan, who was the developer of DBT, she developed it because she found that um, initially she tried to treat people with borderline personality disorder with um, CBT, cognitive behaviour therapy. Everybody's heard of it if you've had any dealings in the mental health space. But, but people with CB, BPD found CBT to be incredibly harsh, judgmental, and fundamentally invalidating. So she tried the humanistic approaches, and people found that while it was validating and they felt understood and they felt met and cared for, they did not get them the change that they needed to get out of their suffering. So she created this therapy that basically jumps between acceptance and change and, and moving back and forth between those two truths so that um, people could become more, more functional, basically. And, and the four modules of DBT that get taught in the skills groups are acceptance skills, which is... Um, why do I need these skills? Like we, we go through the problems that people are having and saying, well, is that something, you know, that you would want to change? And, and so, so orienting towards that sort of, um, I guess it's an acceptance skill, it moves towards the change, but it's also um, learning how to get through distressing situations, which is distress tolerance. And then the change skills, which is what we're going to talk about today, is the emotional regulation skills. Skills. So, you know, looking at what emotional processes we're going through and whether 
letting that emotion kind of be front and center is necessarily effective. Uh, and then the, the fourth module is um, interpersonal effectiveness. So this is when basically they, people have got those skills to tolerate distress, when they can regulate their emotions more effectively, then they can start working on those interpersonal effectiveness skills. Um, so the Family Connections Group, for example, focuses a lot more on the interpersonal effectiveness skills because it's aimed at, at family. Jenny, um, your audio is still having some in and out um, disasters. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, you do keep on coming from, like it's clear and then it seems like you're underwater again. Do you have um, any options at all? Oh, we can try, we can try the, um, I do have an option that sometimes has worked brilliantly and other times has been worse. All right. Let's all cross our fingers. So we'll try for it and we'll see how we go. I'm very sorry. That's okay. These these things happen. So how does it today? Are we going to have luck with it today? It sounds fantastic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we should have checked it before like we were going to. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I'm very sorry for those that missed it before. Uh, hopefully the information that's on the slides will have helped you at least. Um, so, oh yeah, and then finally, the program that I do DBT groups in is uh, DBT, as it's called in Western Australia. That's not a, that's just an, a name that we have for it in Lifeline, but um, uh, DBT for adolescents and their families uh, has a fifth module called Walking the Middle Path, which has a lot more emphasis on that dialectical stuff and a lot more emphasis on validation. Um, and also that sort of uh, behaviour change strategies. So um, rewarding and reinforcing your own behaviour change, um, their behaviour change, how you can sort of shape that change into your relationship. It's really um, great stuff. I did a, uh, a webinar on that um, a few months ago. So that's up on the website if you want to see it. Um, okay, and just it's just worth, um, yeah, and, and, and the, the skills groups are meant to just be a place where people can come and share about their week and in terms of practicing the skills, not in terms of, oh, I've had the worst week, but more sort of, I, I had a tough week and I used this skill and I found that it didn't work or it did work. And then the facilitators can work with them on, on uh, you know, what they might have missed in using that skill or what other skill they might have been able to use and then teaching people new skills. So um, in the submitted questions, there was a question about the different ways that DBT is um, delivered. So a full DBT program is skills groups, um, an individual therapist, a psychiatrist, uh, and then a consultation team for the professionals working with the, um, the cohort and um, so that they can really manage you know, what is basically a really difficult and really challenging cohort together. That's a big part of it. Uh, and ideally, the, these groups would be um, run over a six-month period and then be repeated. So a full DBT program is a full year. Uh, and people can repeat it if they uh, want to and need to. Um, in reality, most private facilities, in fact, all the private facilities in Perth uh, deliver skills group only. Now, somebody might have an individual therapist who knows DBT skills and they can back it up. Um, but that is, uh, it's not as integrated as, as, um, as what, you know, Linehan designed it to be. However, the skills groups have been found to be very effective even without the individual therapy. Uh, you can also have an individual therapist who is who is trained in DBT and that they can be teaching DBT skills. Uh, and, you know, what my experience of doing that is and, and talking to other therapists and certainly looking at, um, you know, the training that I've done around it is 
that tends to be a more ad hoc as you need it. Okay, you're struggling with your distress. I'm going to teach you this skill this week, responding to how that person's week's been. You know, you don't move through in a structured, in as structured a way as you would with um, a group because people come to individual therapy wanting to talk about, you know, the individual stuff as well. Um, in a full DBT program, individual therapy is where you would talk about suicidality, where you would talk about any attempts or any self-harming or any behaviour, um, problematic behaviour, all of that would get discussed in that individual um, session relating to the skills, but the skills are not being taught in the individual session, whereas if you're only doing an individual session, then that is, um, you know, the, the individual therapist has to try and squeeze in teaching the skills, giving the homework, and then trying to, you know, do a more regular therapy session. So it's a bit of a juggle. I hope that answered that question. Um, Okay, now what's happening? Um, and before each module, there is always orientation and mindfulness is taught. So you, you sort of go through why do you need this, the skills for this particular module and mindfulness, because mindfulness is everything. You know, if you cannot notice what is happening for you, if you cannot name it, um, if you cannot be with it, if you cannot choose to, you know, move forward mindfully once you've made a decision, then it's very hard to do any of these skills or even to know which skill you should be using in a particular moment. The core uh, skill in order to be able to do, the core mindfulness skill in order to be able to do um, emotional regulation is something called wise mind, which, uh, you know, Linehan said that, you know, we, we tend to sort of orient to either reasonable mind, which is that, that cool, rational, task-focused kind of the uh, Star Trek fans out there, that Mr. Spock approach to life. And um, emotional mind is more hot. It's mood-dependent. It's people-focused. It's, you know, impulsive. It's, you know, really um, overwhelming. It can also, it doesn't always have to be hot emotion either. It can be, um, it can be a complete numbing out is also an emotion mind response because you're not you're not able to access your rational mind. You're just completely numbed out. You're zoned out. You're dissociated. So um, it's not just hot. Um, and um, the um, yeah. Uh, and if you if you do if you have ever watched a Star Trek episode, I'm hoping that with an older cohort here tonight that people know what I'm talking about because they're teenagers. I can't use this example at all. If you think about all the challenges that um, you know Mr. Spock and Captain Kirk went through, it was always when they combined both as attributes of the leads that they actually got to the solution. And that's how we want to be as well. We want to be able to. Uh, access our wise mind. So I'm talking about wise mind now because we, whenever we're interrogating ourselves about our emotions and about whether it's they're appropriate or not, we really want to be in wise mind. Um, so who's DBT for? It was developed for people with borderline personality disorders, but it's also effective with substance abuse disorders, eating disorders, suicidality, depressive and anxiety disorders, ADHD. PTSD related to childhood sexual abuse, that's presumably because that was a study that was done in that area, bipolar disorder, and pre-adolescent children with emotional and behavioural dysregulation because one of the great myths out there is that um, um, is that you can't diagnose a personality disorder until someone's 18 because, hey, none of us have a personality before we're 18. Um, so that is a big, big myth. Don't let people tell you that. It's, it's also um, people do that because they also want to protect people. Um, so uh, it can also, you know, not having it on someone's, someone's record, health record may not be a bad thing. Uh, but certainly talking to someone about, you know, look, you know, we think that you, you're, um, you know, you're, you're a very emotionally sensitive person who experiences a lot of emotional dysregulation, fear of abandonment, all of those sorts of things make us think that you have BPD or that you're developing it or, you know, that you've got BPD traits because it gives people a language and a, and a means to understand what is happening for them and their families. And um, 
you know, I just wish more people would talk more honestly about that and move away from that shame and stigma because, you know, how do you solve a problem if you can't define it? Um, so the fundamental assumption underneath DBT is that the problems that people have are because they don't have the skills to deal with them. So basically they don't use effective behaviour because they don't know how to. So, you know, that's hence the big focus on teaching people skills um, and, you know, getting them to use them in their lives outside of the skills group. Um, okay. So with uh, BPD in particular, so borderline personality disorder, or if you prefer to call it emotional um, Sorry, I was just thinking emotionally unstable personality disorder, EUPD, which I don't particularly, some people prefer that, that term. Um, there are five main areas of dysregulation. Dysregulation being when you are more than upset, you are out of control. Uh, and as you can see, of those five, emotional dysregulation is right at the front and center. And, and that is when you know, the emotion that you're feeling, it's not that it's bad to feel emotions, but the emotion that you're feeling is too big or too small or, you know, not appropriate to the situation that you're in. And, of course, if you have emotional dysregulation and you, you know, get really, really angry all of a sudden, then that's going to lead to interpersonal dysregulation, for example, because people are not going to like being yelled at um, or your your fear of being abandoned leads you to, get too clingy with people that's going to be chaotic and then if you your emo if your relationships are dysregulated then that's going to feed into more emotional dysregulation then you might turn into you know having this self-loathing self-dysregulation which can then lead to behavioral dysregulation and also this is where sometimes people can get uh, misdiagnosed as well because it, you know this extreme emotional dysregulation can also lead to cognitive dysregulation so having uh, paranoid thoughts uh, you might have transient psychosis um, not be able to think things through you know it, they all feed into each other so um, you know presumably you're here because you're living through this in some way with with someone in your life so you know um, it's difficult it's really difficult so the other thing about people with BPD, um, and this is where emotional regulation is so important, um, is what makes them different. This biological characteristics are what we call, she talks about, um, Linehan talks about a biosocial model. So there's a biological factor to people with um, emotional sensitivity, and there is an environmental or a social factor to it, which is this high sensitivity leads to a lot of invalidation leads to being in an environment that doesn't get you that that leads to more emotional dysregulation and so on and so forth so what this might look like is that some people are born with um, a fairly low stable emotional baseline it takes a lot to upset them and other people are already on edge when they're born they're already sensitive to everything around them and you know their day might start and the same Thing can happen to them they might be driving to work I apologize to anyone that's heard this example before but they could be driving to work someone pulls out in front of them and they have to slam on the brakes and you know Ms Green is very calm and she's like oh okay well that's all right I avoided that everything's okay but um, Mr Brown might be oh my god that person what an idiot you know they just this is just the worst I nearly hit them they're expressing a lot of anger, which is a secondary emotion, because if you think about it, when someone pulls out in front of you, the first thing you might feel is fear. And then they have a slow return to baseline. So Ms. Green's kind of pretty much back at baseline 10 minutes later. But uh, Mr. Brown hasn't really come down yet. And then, again, the same thing could happen. Something else could happen. They could spill their coffee. And, you know, Ms. Green might go, off. Oh, Damn, that's okay. I'll clean it up when I get to work. But um, you know, if Mr. Brown gets to work having spilled their coffee and then someone talks to them at this point, they could again 
you know, react with this really high emotional reaction and um, have that interpersonal dysregulation. And, you know, the person who's just said, hey, did you get that report done? Might be wondering, why are they going off at me? All I asked was a simple question, but it's because of this, this lack of being able to get back down to their baseline quickly. It takes them a long time. So, you know, the skills I'm going to talk about tonight are about learning how to bring yourself back down to that baseline so that the next thing that upsets you doesn't get you up here. You know, you're just able to just move through steadily. Um, okay. The other thing that is a problem often for this people that we work with in this area is something called alexithymia, which is a fancy cobbled together Greek term uh, to do with the difficulty in experiencing, expressing and describing emotions to self, oneself and others. So the A is no, Lexi is words for emotions. So not having the words for the emotions means how do you know how can you communicate to other people what is going on for you if you cannot name what you're feeling because either you've numbed out or you are feeling so much? You, you know, I, I've had young people say to me, I feel everything. I'm feeling it all. So, um, you know, this is a real problem. So, so teaching people how to recognise what they're feeling is a really big part of what DBT is about. Um, and unfortunately... You know, you don't get to choose which emotions you don't feel. If you want to numb one, you numb them all. You know, we, we lose them all. Um, and if we can name them, we can tame them. So I'm going to show you, uh, this is Marsha Linehan, who's the creator of DBT. And uh, I will say that I think one of the things that makes this such a powerful um, therapy is that uh, she has lived experience. So when she, in the 1960s, when she was 18, she ended up being hospitalised for two years because she was so intensely distressed and suicidal. Um, and uh, as a result of that experience, she swore that if she could get herself out of hell, then she would go and find, get well enough and find a way to get other people out of hell as well. So that was her wish. So just give me a moment while I get the video up. Okay, and hopefully you'll hear it. Um, it might be having the, the headphones in means that you don't hear it. So if you don't, yeah, jump on the chat and we'll, we'll take it back to the beginning again. There's no sound yet. It, are you getting it? Are you getting no the sound? sound? No sound. No sound. Okay. Let's try again. Borderline personality disorder is primarily a pervasive disorder of emotions. It is the inability to regulate emotions. And by emotions, I'm talking about a very broad, broad spectrum. Not only how you feel, but the physiology of emotions, the experience of emotions, and the actions associated with emotions. It's a group of people with extraordinarily intense emotional suffering who are also simultaneously unable to change their suffering and regulate the behavior that um, comes from that suffering. So the problem there is how do you teach emotional regulation? So I developed an entire module of strategies for regulating emotions. And those strategies have been taken from the science of emotions and from the evidence-based treatments that treat emotions. You know, if we had a person who had a, a treatment for one emotion, I simply looked at what do those therapists tell that patient to do? And then I repackaged all that as a skill. I would have to say about half of my patients, if you ask them how they feel, what their emotion is, they're, they're, they're functioning like they're looking in a fog. They look down and they think, I have no idea. They have no idea what their emotion is. So the first thing we have to do is teach them how to do that. We have strategies which are very effective for that. And then we have to teach them how to regulate. So there are many strategies for regulation. You can look at the vulnerability factors. So often you're very emotional today because of something that happened yesterday, because you didn't sleep, because you didn't eat. 
because of some stress from yesterday. So one of the things we look at is what are the factors that make you vulnerable to being emotional and how can you change those factors? So we look at that. We look at what is the prompting event, meaning what happened right before? Is that something that you can change? If you can, that would be teaching problem solving. If you can't change it, we go to the next, which is what's your interpretation or what's your thoughts about that? We have a skill called check the facts. How do you check the facts to see if your interpretations are correct? So on and on. I mean, there are a lot of different sub-skills in emotion regulation. We know that emotion regulation skills are effective. We've got data on just that all by itself. They are effective in teaching people how to regulate emotions. Okay, give me a moment and I'll get plugged back in. Okay. Um, so, what are our good and bad emotions? This is a trick question, I will say, but just, you know, play along. Uh, what would you say are emotions that are good and emotions that are bad? Just uh, throw some comments in the chat. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, what do you think? Are there, are there any particular emotions that you would say are positive and emotions that you might think are bad or that perhaps you're, the person in your life would label as bad? A little bit happy, yeah. Jealousy, yeah. Feeling happiness, bad, rage, depression, frustration. Feeling superior. Is that an emotion? Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Sad. Yep. Yep. Okay. So um, well, that's, that's pretty typical. You know, most people will say sadness, envy, jealousy, guilt, shame, um, anger, fall into the negative, you know, happiness, love, joy, those sorts of things. Um, a lot of people would not label as good or bad. And many of you have also answered the trick question, which is actually... Um, there is no good or bad emotions. Emotions are just information. So I'm going to bring you back to um, Marsha again. I'm just going to stop share. I've had clients where they get angry and I say, okay, you're avoiding sadness. They say, I can't tolerate sadness. I say, okay, we'll do it for five minutes. So let's talk about what would you be sad about if you were sad? This is one of the main emotions that's avoided in borderline personality disorder in my experience. There's a big difference between struggle to do something and inability to do something. It's actually the inability to tolerate sadness without help. I've done an enormous amount of case consultation with therapists treating individuals with borderline personality disorder. And one of the main problems in many therapists' treatment is that they don't realize that much of the problematic behavior is avoidance behavior and the, what they're avoiding is sadness itself. The average borderline patient believes if I ever experience sadness, I'll fall into the abyss and I will never get out. And the facts of the matter are that's mostly true. They can't get out which is why you have to get them to experience it when they're with you, the therapist, because then I can help them get out of it. I won't give you the discussion on shame, but it is worth looking this one up because shame is a, a big deal in... Um, in uh, for a lot of people with borderline, that's for sure. Um, so the reason that I also put that up was 
you know, one of the problems with naming emotions, which is how we tame them, is that we so quickly go from a primary emotion, which we may not want to feel, to a secondary emotion. So when I was talking before about the car situation, you know, someone pulling out in, in front of you, most people would say that made me really angry. Um, well, a lot of people. But actually, if you think, what is the first emotion when somebody pulls out in front of you? It's fear. I'm going to hit them. I'm going to get hurt. They're going to get hurt. My car's going to get damaged. It's fear first and then, and then anger. So if we try to manage the anger and we don't address the primary emotion, then you know, that can be one of those situations where validation falls down because we're not going to the information, the primary information. We're going to the, the secondary emotion. Okay, um, so the emotion regulation unit teaches, client, teaches the clients to understand and name their emotions, to decrease the frequency of unwanted emotions. So if it's appropriate, change the emotion, only if it's appropriate. If it's appropriate, we might want to stay with it. Um, decrease emotional vulnerability, so we build resilience, and reduce emotional suffering. Another way to say that is to look at this little chart. So the emotion regulation unit is basically divided into understanding and naming the emotions. And then we, that, that means understanding what the functions of emotions are because every emotion, and this is true across, they've done you know, global studies on all different cultures and there's basically nine key emotions that we all feel, anger, joy, sadness, guilt, disgust. These, um, they, these all have a really important role to play in us communicating as humans with each other. Uh, we teach something called the model of emotions, which I'll show you in the next slide. And we learn how to observe the emotion, be with it, describe it, name it. And then once we know which emotion it is that we're dealing with, we might decide if we need to just tolerate it, which is a distress tolerance skill, or if it's not effective in this moment in time, we may want to change um, change it and one of the skills that we use for that is check the facts or uh, problem solving so it might be yes it is absolutely appropriate to be angry and disappointed with someone who's let you down um, if you know you've checked the facts and you know that you know that it was not something beyond their control that led to them letting you down and you might problem solve that. So that might go into using interpersonal effectiveness skills. It might be in going into, okay, I just need to withdraw from this person for a while because being angry with them in this moment is not going to be an effective way of communicating my disappointment. Um, and the other sort of the third part of the emotion regulation skills is looking at how do we uh, decrease emotional vulnerabilities. And this is a shorthand for this skill is something called ABC, please which I'll go through. So this is, this is the overarching structure. And then I'll go into detail as we go through. Um, I forgot to say before, I will um, do a PDF of these slides. So um, we'll distribute them afterwards. Um, I'm not exactly sure how we do that, but that's, that's Belinda, the super Belinda will, will handle that for us. Okay. So what are our good or our emotions? You know, a lot of people come to BP, DBT saying, I just want to get rid of my emotions. Well, sorry, you can't do that because they're really, really great information. They really, they tell us what's important to us. They communicate stuff really effectively. I mean, what are you going to do if you're walking down the street and all of a sudden everybody starts running towards you with fear on their faces and maybe some dust and everything, are you going to stop and say, oh, I wonder what's going on here? You're going to look at all of that fear being communicated and you're going to turn around and run. It's really fast. It's really efficient. It's a really efficient way of getting some information out there. Um, it also, I mean, if, if you see a friend and, you know, they're sitting alone at lunch and they kind of got their head down and, you know, big size and stuff like that, and you care about this person, you know, you're not going to wait for them to say, I'm feeling really bad. You're going to go up and go, hey, is everything okay? It lets us 
become validated you know like we validate by showing that we're interested in somebody we can see that they're you know not in a good space um and every emotion has an action urge attached to it and the other thing is is you can have all the emotions or none i just want to say that again just emphasizing that we cannot edit out the, the emotions that we don't want to feel so for example love encourages us to move towards people that's the action urge that goes with love fear kind of obvious run away withdraw anger it, it, this is the good of anger is it can drive us to overcome obstacles it can get us to address injustices or you know it can cause us to attack people which may not be so good but anger in and of itself is not inherently bad it is communicating something i'm frustrated I, I, I think this is wrong. I, I feel uh, disrespected. I feel threatened. Uh, somebody I love is threatened. You know, it's, it's all information. It's what you do with the information, which is where we might become dysregulated or ineffective. Uh, shame. Shame means that we might hide things that we need to, that could endanger us in our group, uh, get us out of, out of, um, out of, uh, yeah, if we've done something outside of the norms of our social group, it means that we might hide that. Um, so what do we think guilt? What's the, what's the urge that goes with guilt? What's the useful urge that goes with guilt? Again, jump in that. I'll jump on the chat with you. Maybe jump into the chat. Um, what, what would the urge with guilt be? Making amends, correct, okay. Sadness, I think I gave a hint on this and anyone that's watched Inside Out, which I highly recommend as understanding the emotions. Sadness gets us to, gets us to, you know, people connect with us if we're sad. Um, envy, what's the, what's the useful information that envy can give us? You know, this is one that sometimes, sometimes people might label as a bad, as a bad emotion that's right Rachel I want something it can let us know that something that's really important to me and I might it might motivate us to work harder towards getting it uh, jealousy yep it's, so jealousy can be that it, we, we might want to protect an important and desired relationship that we perceive as being threatened by another but this is one we really 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 want to do checking the facts on um, happiness Happiness is great, right? It gets us to do more. We want to do more of what makes us happy. Of course, you know, not working might make us happy and that may not be effective either. So even a so-called positive emotion can have, you know, uh, we need to hold it, that dialectical stance. Um, yeah, and I just um, want to... Uh, there's two that are quite close together. Envy and jealousy are often misunderstood. Envy is like you look at something and you aspire to it. You want it. I want their car. I want their, maybe I want their kind of, the kind of relationship they've got or I want to have a degree or whatever. Um, and jealousy is more I've got this and I want to keep it or I want to take it from you. So it's just a, a subtle difference there. Same thing with guilt and shame. Guilt tends to be when we, violate our own norms and shame is more when we violate society's norms so for example lgbtqi people may feel a lot of shame around being queer uh, because that's a socially imposed situation whereas you know in my book they should not feel that way <laughs> the, you know the, the shame is not you check the facts on that emotion and go actually you do you you know it's okay um, so, yeah, and disgust obviously stops us from eating things that might make us sick or from being around people that may violate our values. Um, okay, the model of emotions. This is just something that I'm not going to go through because we'll, we'll run out of time. But it's, it's just something that we will talk about where we, it's like if you imagine taking a film of an explosion and, and, slowing it down frame by frame and go oh, what led up to that explosion and what might you know at what point could they have put the water on it or you know put it out so we do that within a with a um 
uh, with an interaction where somebody might have uh, noticed that in the chat someone was saying that after doing something impulsive you know that will be followed up with shame so you know we might feel we might let's say um see our partner chatting at a party to somebody else and they're having a great time and laughing and we get that rush of jealousy you know and it you know we learn to name those feelings so you notice the rush of maybe heat to your face you might notice the the, the clenching in your stomach, you know, all of those sorts of things. And with that, you might have urges to go up and, you know, yell at him or yell at her or whatever. Um, and what other, other people might see is they might see you clenching your fists. They might see you, you know, storming up. Um, so, you know, you would name that emotion as jealousy. If you've followed through on the action urges, then you might then go into, you know, a breakdown in the relationship. You might go into shame. Uh, the shame may then, you know, drive you into thoughts about how useless you are and how this always happens or thoughts of they shouldn't have done that, it's their fault, and then, boom, you, you're running around the, the, the model again. So the idea is, is by breaking it down to a model like this, there are all the different skills that can be thrown in and to to derail this situation, to, to take this, take the steam out to, um, yeah, change things. And it's to go, oh, okay, I'm feeling a little bit jealous here. You use the check the facts. Is this person really, you know, do I know this person? Maybe, maybe it's someone they went to school with and they're really, they haven't seen each other in a really long time and they're just friends, you know, like what do I actually know here? That's the check the facts skill. You know, it might be, hmm, she's being a bit sus and I don't want to have this fight in this moment, so I'm going to validate that I'm feeling jealous and I might wait to deal with this later on when I'm, I'm calmer and it's a better situation. You know, what's going to be effective in these things? So that's, that's kind of going back to that question about groups and individual therapists. This is definitely something you would work through with an individual therapist, you know, around a particular incident. So I'm going to show you a little bit of Brene Brown because um, this is a great one around, you know, why we have emotions and how they really help us to connect. Let's get to the right one. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. 
I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Yeah, so, I mean, the point of that being that you need to have an idea of what emotion the other person is feeling if you want to connect with them. And you also want to have, a, you also want to be able to check in with your own emotional response so that you can validate them, you know, and, and this is why, you know, we need to really be uh, kind of, well, I call it being an emotion detective, but also being really emotionally literate ourselves in order to uh, help ourselves first and help our loved ones. So what makes regulating emotion difficult? Biology, I went through that earlier, the lack of skills we've gone through. Sometimes it's environmental re reinforcement of emotional behavior. So that might be that someone only gets uh, validated when they really act up. And, uh, and that might, that, I'm not necessarily saying that's true in a, um, it might not be in the family environment. It might be elsewhere or something like that. It might be that there is so much else going on in, in, a, in, a, in a family system or in a, a social system that, you know, it's only when particular emotions come out that they, they get any kind of, uh, that, that, that they get reinforced. Sometimes it's about being willful. So what's willfulness? This is when people really are much more uh, connected to wanting to be right. You know, there's that old saying, you can be right or you can be happy. So, you know, when am I being will willing? When I'm willing to consider that I could be wrong, when I'm willing to consider that even if I'm right, really arguing this point right now may not be effective, that uh, being right is getting in the way of me connecting with someone I love. Um, and, uh, you know, and when you're saying things like they should or it's not fair, this is where we bring in those sort of acceptance of what's going on. Uh, it may be that someone is just so overloaded with, with one or many emotions that they just, you know, where do they start? Uh, and, then, and then there are emotion myths. So some of the emotion myths are things like there's a right way to feel in, in every situation, letting others know how I feel is, is a weakness, negative feelings are bad and destructive, um, some emotions are stupid, uh, Creativity requires intense out of control emotions. Drama is cool. It's inauthentic to try and change my emotions. Emotional truth is what counts, not, fact, not factual truth. I mean, there are 20 I could go through here, but uh, you can see how it would get in the way of um, wanting to change them necessarily. So, and, and I must, I want to go back and just say that this is about us as much as it is about the people in our lives, right? This is, like we're emotional beings too and denying our own emotional load or our own emotional sensitivities makes it really hard to be effective. So when we want to change our emotions, we want to check the facts. Um, so we want to think about, are the, you know, did the event actually pro prompt the emotions or was it our inter interpretation or thoughts of the event? So when the guy pulled out in front of us, you know, was the anger prompted by the person pulling out in front of us or was it prompted by our own interpretations of they should be more careful on the road. They're an idiot. Why do people always do that? Those are the thoughts that can drive it. So, you know, someone pulls out, we have lots of negative thoughts about it, and that brings, to, brings up the emotions of anger. Sometimes it can be that we have the emotion and the event, and then emotions will drive it. Or some, you know, so it might be um, uh, I get, frustrated with the technology around doing something like this and so the emotion is you know the event something doesn't go right techni technically I get an emotion of frustration and then I have thoughts around oh god I'm so hopeless why does this always happen to me 
oh no, everyone's going to think I'm useless. And then I'm, you know, going into a spiral of anxiety and ineffectiveness. Also, conversely, I can have the thoughts of it's okay, everybody has been frustrated by Zoom at some point since 2020. We're all familiar with how it can go wrong and I can only do the best I can and, you know, next time I'll try and do better. So, you know, our thoughts can also bring our emotions down as well. So it's about being aware around that stuff. So the steps to checking the facts is what's the emotion I want to change? What is the event prompting my emotion? What are my interpretations, thoughts and assumptions about the event? Am I assuming a threat? So sometimes when we go, we find that we're in that willing, that willful place, you know, where we don't want to change the emotion. What is the threat? What's getting in the way? I had a group interaction with someone where they, um, they were really had a go at me and, and then I turned around and had a go at them. Very, di- very dialectical. Uh, I too am human. Um, and I really 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 struggle to be dialectical about this person and this situation because I really felt like I was in the right and uh, I was a little bit more clever and didn't voice that I thought I was in the right but the other person did but you know if we ask about it what was the threat that I I can't speak for for them but I'll say for me what was my threat my threat was exclusion from the group so it was important to me to say right because then I would have the right to stay in the group you know, that's, that, that's, that's how we sort of ask what's the, what's the threat. Uh, what's the catastrophe? Well, really, if I got excluded from the group, would it be a catastrophe? Perhaps not. Um, and does my emotion and or its intensity fit the actual facts? And check that you're in wise mind when you do all of this. That's why I showed you the wise mind thing. So if the facts don't match, then we want to do opposite action. So when we go through those urges, that go with each emotion, like sadness to withdraw. If the facts don't fit that we need to be so sad, then we need to do the opposite action of reaching out, of stepping out, of getting, of, of activating ourselves um, and doing that all the way. Uh, or we might need to problem solve. So when the facts themselves are the problem, solving the problem will reduce the frequency of negative emotions. Someone might be genuinely sad because they don't actually have friends. So who are they going to go out and meet with? Well, that becomes a problem-solving issue then, doesn't it? How do you, let's get you out there. Let's join a club. Let's, you know, um, and if you join the club, don't just go in and hide at the back waiting for people to come up to you. Actually go up and introduce yourself and, you know, this is something you would, um, a young person with DBT, with BPD, for example, might, you know, rehearse with their therapist and cope ahead and go through all the, all the barriers to doing that. Um, And finally, ABC Please, the teaser I gave you before, stands for accumulating positive emotions. So this means going out and doing pleasant things that are possible now. We have a lovely, um, we're doing a DBT group, DBT group at the moment, and it always happens that the emotion regulation uh, unit just falls just ahead of the um, school holidays. So we bring the accumulate positive stuff forward and we give the young people and their parents, the uh, homework of going through a list of pleasant things to do, circling the ones that they want to do alone and circling the ones that they want to do with their parent or young person and then seeing where they match up and committing to doing those over the holidays because in the midst of all the drama, you can still have a good time. You can still do things that fill your well. It's okay. It doesn't reduce the severity in fact it will reduce the severity but it doesn't mean that you're not taking the other stuff seriously it just means that you're feeling you well and you and you're having that that pleasant time together um and the long term you make changes that are you know so that more positive events will happen more often connect to values goals and priorities the b stands for build mastery this is about doing things that make you feel competent and effective and noticing when you're being competent and effective to combat the helplessness and hopelessness. So this this applies to parents, you know, or partners or, you know, whatever the relationship is that brought you here tonight. And the really important thing is is that you want to set that mastery challenge, you know, in that mid-range. You don't want to make it so hard that um, you can't do it and you don't want to make it so easy, you know, that it's just, 
like it's not really an achievement to do it because frankly you could already do it so it's it's you know doing that step by step so I'm you know in my whatever age I am now learning the cello and you know the challenge for me is to practice it every day and I'm still in first position after a year and that's okay because I'm noticing that I'm getting better and I'm not giving myself the, the task of you know being able to play all six spark cello suites by the end of the year I'm just putting it at a, where am I at and I'm also not going to just only stay you know where I was last month either so um and I do and I must say it does make me feel better learning it so yeah and finally C is cope ahead so cope ahead's describe the emotional situation and choose the problem solving skills and rehearse and practice after rehearsing and part of cope ahead there's another really great video from um Marsha where she talks about how she used this skill to overcome her anxiety of going through the tunnels in um, Seattle where she lives uh, because she started getting anxious about going into them and her cope ahead was to imagine the absolute worst situation and how she would deal with it and it ended up with you know if 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 there was an earthquake and everything fell down and there was a fire and she definitely couldn't get out and she was going to die then she would radically accept that I mean that's jumping way ahead but basically you know it worked for her because she's very skillful well okay someone's got a pen out um and um yeah basically uh it was able it was enough to um reduce the anxiety for her to the point of it not being a problem anymore okay hang on where am I going now just let me let's annotate Done. Um, okay, and please stands for taking care of. This is about reducing the vulnerabilities. So, come on, now it's not letting me go. Hang on, now. It's, so the plot is treat physical illness. So obviously, if there's something organic going on for you that you can't sleep, or you're in constant pain, or um, you know you have an eating disorder, then you know really these things need to be addressed. Um, balanced eating avoid mood altering substances unless they're prescribed uh, and working sleep um, and there's a whole page that we do on you know dealing with sleep and exercise so obviously these are if we can look after those um, five skills then you know we're already going to be less likely to lose it because let's face it who hasn't not being able to who hasn't slept and then gone and lost it with someone or not been particularly skillful that day okay um and you can click on this link when you get the p well i don't know if you can but I'll, I'll try and do it so that you can actually click on the link when you um um get the pdf if you do but i really Something that really blew me away, and I will apologize in advance, there's a little bit of swearing in this, um, is this woman was talking about emotions at work and how our modern culture sort of says, shut up to all our emotions and just, you know, get on and be incredibly productive at work. Uh, and this is what she says. I've really become very interested in how and why we shut down the emotions and how and why we develop this absurd and dysfunctional idea of positive and negative emotions. What I've realized is that the so-called negative emotions shake up the status quo and the so-called positive emotions go along. In the capitalist, sexist, racist, ableist, transphobic, homophobic world, these negative emotions would stand up and say, this is some shit and we need to change it and we need to change it every day and it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. I think that turning emotions into negative and positive, which was a terrible idea, is a way to maintain social control and keep a death kind of death cult going. I think the so-called positive emotions, happiness, contentment, and joy, they're beautiful, they're lovely, they're wonderful, and they belong with their friends, all of the other emotions. I notice that when people believe there are negative emotions, they don't develop any skills with them. But when they believe there are positive emotions, they become abusive towards those emotions. They strap them on and they try to keep them with them at every possible time. And happiness, contentment and joy are like, I'll do what you ask, but my God, I need my friends. I need my anger to set boundaries. I need my shame to help me figure out what's going on. I need my grief to see what has died. 
I need my depression. I need my fear and my anxiety and my panic. So that's that. Okay. So questions? I think Belinda was going to, oh, actually, we had a couple. I can, I can get us started. Yes, oh. we do have a, have a couple that came through early. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has any questions, um, pop them in the chat now and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can up until 8.30. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's one question was about how to give validation when there's violence. So it's really important. Um, sorry, the question was, we give emotional validation and reassurance to our daughter while also getting her to understand that she cannot continue to behave violently or how do we get them to do that in our home. Um, she sees any suggestion that she cannot stay if she behaves violently as abandonment, but we cannot allow her to continue to be violent and aggressive towards other family members. Um, you know, the really important thing about validation is we validate the valid. So you can val you can, I think you can validate that, yeah, sure, I can understand how you would feel like, like we're abandoning you. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are. Um, it, it, it just means that that's how she's feeling and you can validate that. And the dialectical stance of that is and violence has consequences and, you know, we, we can't, you know, we owe it to ourselves to stay safe and to other family members to stay safe as well. So, yeah, you can validate that she's upset and feels abandoned by that and that it must be quite frightening for her. And this is our boundary. This is our limit. Really tough thing to do. I'm not, I'm, you know, it's, it's very easy to just say that. I, I get that that's a really difficult thing to actually do. Um, there was another one um, about asking about prenatal contributing factors for the development of BPD. I, out of my remit I'm sorry I'm, I'm a counsellor but that would certainly be an interesting one for psychiatrists and it's definitely uh, something around transgenerational trauma to there um, I think I answered the one about effectiveness of DBT in different settings um, and uh, someone asking about their daughter who's on a lot of medication to manage her mental health uh, she hasn't started DBT yet and that you're not happy with her taking such a, a large amount of medication. Um, so I can't talk about medication, but I can say what best practice says around and all the psychiatrists who specialise in BPD say, and that is that what's called polypharmacology, which is more than three drugs, is not indicated. It's not effective. And that really you should not be on more than one or than, you know, two, maybe three. And um, you know that that's that's something that you have to address with the psychiatrist and uh yeah that's a really difficult one and different and you know it seems you know medication is such a difficult thing um and i think you know really and it, and i also acknowledge that it's very very difficult to find uh, good psychiatrists particularly in the country um but definitely trying to find people who are um uh, informed and and you know if I think of that Andrew Cheney and um oh gosh I've gone blank Linda the guy that heads up um the BPD foundation is on the um I oh. so sorry <laughs> oh, yeah this is what happens to me after an hour of talking <laughs> um but also Bryn Grenier in um in New South Wales, you know, like there are some really fantastic psychiatrists in Australia who are doing, you know, contributing to the, to world knowledge on on BPD. So, um, but finding them and getting access to them is, you know, that's the hard thing. Um, yeah. So, fourteen new messages. What what other ones have we got, Belinda? Um, there's a few questions around validation, and and I would highly encourage uh, these people who are asking these questions to try and get into one of our family connections programs. Validation is a huge skill to learn, um, and it, it's one of the most amazing skills to learn. It take it does take a lot of practice to to learn it and do it really effectively. Um, Yeah. 
Any questions for groups in other areas, uh, groups in Canberra? Um, BPD and the ACT is a Canberra-based um, BPD support organisation. They will be definitely worth contacting. Um, Jenny, do you know anything about considerations which need to be taken for therapy when BPD co-occurs with a well autism, uh, autism spectrum and disorder, ADHD? ADHD. Um, yeah, look, uh, um, I think that there's, I think, I actually think that a lot of ADHD has been misdiagnosed as, as BPD because there's really massive um, overlaps in terms of the impulsivity and in terms of the emotional dysregulation and in terms of sensitivities. And also there's an overlap with ADHD and BPD and autism in terms of um, that, that um, sensitivity to stimuli. I, I think I have um, somewhere on the spectrum of ADHD, hence having my lovely weighted lap blanket on today to keep me grounded while I do this anxiety provoking thing and, um, and getting terribly distracted by notifications coming up. Um, and, you know, there, there are things with ADHD, uh, where we talk about, um, rejection sensitivity dysphoria. So becoming very emotionally distressed by perceived re rejection or, or ruminating over something that they think that they might've said in a social situation that, oh, everybody's going to hate me now, you know, and they get stuck on that one thought, um, Um, yeah, and um, with a ASD, I guess the uh, the challenge is um, perhaps with that that sort of a struggle with being dialectical. That that can be the the bigger the biggest struggle. That sort of being quite polarized on I'm right, and this is the way to do things, and they should, and you know that can be a power, but. Um, it can also be quite difficult. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, the but but what I will say is that um, that in the in the groups that we do at Lifeline, so we will have twelve um, dyads, so we'll have twenty four people in a group, um, parent and child, and um, or carer and child, and uh, there are a lot of the young people that have co occurring. ADHD co-occurring ASD um, and it you know it, in, in my experience it tends to be pretty helpful um, eating disorders are problematic um, because it depends on how 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 disordered their eating is um, if they're not really capable of learning because they're starving their brains, then it, then a skills group is not appropriate. Um, and that is one of, you know, like, depending on how bad their eating disorder is, that's one of the exclusion criteria for our group is are they, you know, um, where are they at with that? But with if it's not too bad, then, um, yes, definitely it can be um, effective. But really for eating disorders, you want to look out for something called RO DBT, which is radically open DBT. And that is recognizing that um, it's, I haven't, I haven't been trained in it, but what I know is that it's a form of DBT that is aiming at um, over control. So most people, when they look at um, people with BPD, which is what DBT was initially created for, it's a question of under control, under control of emotions, under control of impulses, under control of behaviour. But there is another form of emotional dysregulation, which is over control, damping everything down. I must eat this. I have to control how much I eat. I have to control where I go. Don't change my routine. So, um, you know, it, 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 the skills change for that and it becomes more about um uh i think it's something to do with you know what are the signs of safety so it's it's it, the over control is kind of triggered from an anxiety point of view and it's how do how do how do you find the signals of safety so that you can regulate and then not be as controlling so that would 
again, difficult to find people. There are some good talks out there on it, but um, yeah, that's for eating disorders, the DBT that is created is called Radically Open DBT. How do you validate if you're being criticised? Start with yourself. Validate that it's really difficult to be criticised um, and, uh, and make sure you're emotionally regulated and in mind, in wise mind. And then, um, and then you might sort of what can look, go, okay, what can I validate about what's going on for this person? And it might be that they're really upset. They're criticising you because you've said that they can't do something. Well, you can validate that it's upsetting to be denied doing something and not give it to them. <laughs> you know? But, you know, you can still validate, yeah, I get it. I get that it's really hard to not be able to go out with your friends. I'd be upset too. And you still can't go out with your friends because, you know, you're grounded. Um, um, I think there's been a couple of questions about uh, how effective is DPT when there is uh, substance abuse mm. involved? Yeah, again, um, I think you, you want to... Uh, um, so with our group, we um, people can have... It depends on how bad it is. Like we get them to talk to us about how bad it is and we might say, well, look, you need to go to a, um, a service to deal with the addiction first. Um, if, it's, if it's, you know, not too bad, you know, and this is a weighing it up kind of thing, um, then uh, it might be they have to commit to coming to the group um, in our, so this is the, our program, uh, it will be you don't come to the group um, under the influence. Uh, but in the training that I've done with BBT, some programs might be you must not appear to be under the influence. So you can still be, you know, but it's not going to be as effective, you know. But, uh, and there are, um, you know, there are definitely worksheets around dealing with, um, you know, when the, when the problem is addiction. I haven't done a lot of work in that space, so I'm not really um, the best person to talk to that. With family connections, families and people in a relationship with someone who has BPD and substance abuse, the family connections program is still going to be like vastly effective in, in improving your communication and interpersonal skills even if that person is continuing to use substances. Yeah. Even if you're just validating yourself. I mean, you know, the first thing about, and, and the, you know, what I hope people take away from this is, okay, well, how can I manage my own emotions first? And, and you know, that's what, that's what this is about. Um, there's a question about cognitive dysregulation. What strategies would you suggest for supporting someone with this? I mean, I think that's about, you know, it comes back to, you know, helping them to become emotionally regulated because I really feel like the emotional regulation is driving the cognitive dysregulation. Uh, you certainly don't try and reason them out of it. You know, nobody's ever reasoned an emotional or cognitively dysregulated person out of it. I did a training course once with um, uh, dealing with people with psychosis and it was really fantastic because it was just basically... Um, you know, if someone's claiming that the person across the road is spying on them, you know, because they've got a paranoid delusion, you don't say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that they, that, you know, um, it's just like, wow, okay, that, that must feel very uncomfortable for you to think that. Should we go and grab a coffee? Let's go out. Let's get away from the house. You know, like you're not going, yeah, that's right. You're going, oh, that's a very difficult feeling to have and then distract. I thought that was very powerful. Um, uh, there's an, I got a direct question about someone around a therapist that didn't want to talk to the daughter about self-harming after they'd self-harmed. Um, that's really not good. Um, you know, um, what, what we do in individual therapy with self-harming and any suicidal urges and that is we, we bring it out into the open and we go through um, what, how did you 
what was going on for you that you wanted to do that? And often the response is, I don't know, I don't know. I was just, you know, going, okay, well, let's think about what happened the day before or what, what was going on there. And, you know, and um, they should have an active safety plan and the safety plan should not just be about suicidality. The safety plan should be about other urges. So it might be urges to lie. It might be urges to um, sneak out at night. It might be urges to self-harm, you know, and, and it's like, as as they learn more distress tolerance skills as they learn emotional regulation skills they add it to the safety plan so they've got this list of other strategies because you know um if we go right back to the first slide everything has a cause and um you know the urge to self-harm or self-harming is an emotional regulation strategy people do it because it works you know to some people some people try it because their friends have done it and they go Ooh, I don't like that it doesn't work for me but for someone who you know so it's important to understand why what do they get from it so you know to not go well you shouldn't do it anyway it's like okay did you feel better after doing it okay so that's so it's got a function let's find a function that doesn't leave a lot of scars for you or it might be that that physical scars have an appeal because emotional scar, you know, the emotional pain can't be seen and is invalidated. And if you have physical scars, you know, people have to look after you. So, you know, like if you, if you assume that everything has a cause and everything has a reason, then, you know, you can kind of validate that without validating the self-harm and encourage them to use other effective strategies and find other effective strategies because you know in the distress tolerance skills not everything works for everyone more about or every time um what else oh, the one about how do you disengage de-escalate safely when there's aggression well, yeah well that's a difficult one but i think it's getting early you know, like when you can see the signs and, you know, um, even maybe even have a conversation with someone. There was another one about aggression, about um, people not remembering how aggressive they were. You know, that's genuine. That's part of the cognitive dysregulation. That's part of shutting down the shame. So they just, uh, and it's also um, part of sometimes um, that, you know, we talked about the self this regulation about that not having a strong sense of self so sometimes it's about um they didn't feel it they didn't feel it they were being aggressive so they don't understand that you could feel that they were being aggressive they don't have that what's called mentalization they can't see how it is for the other person so because it wasn't a big deal for them it mustn't be a big deal for you or they've 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 wiped it out they've wiped it out because they can't be, deal with the shame so, um, so um, I have suggested that they can recommend some support, uh, some youth services for BPD loved ones who are also dealing with addiction issues in the background. Yeah. Uh, yes, please, Liz, send that through in the chat. Oh, someone's recommended it? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that if you go to the BPD Foundation, so I think it's just bpdfoundation.org.au. Anyway, on that on my slides, there's a list. There's actually you can click on your state, and there'll be a, there's a whole list of public or not for profit services in each state for families and for for people for loved ones with BPD. Um, and Yeah, somebody's, oh, sorry, there's something about when you're feeling emotions are high to late, heightened and they're escalating and you're feeling that way, uh, self-validation definitely and stop. The stop skill is amazing, which is literally stop, take a step back, use your mindfulness, observe what's going on for you, observe what's happening and then proceed mindfully. And, um, you know, what I really love about doing the DB team groups is that the young people and the adults are learning the skills alongside each other. So they, they can go, I just need to stop now. I need to do a stop. I need to step away. I need to regulate. And we can come back and talk about this once I'm regulated right now. 
I'm not regulated. I need to stop. Um, um, I think I think well we're we're almost at um six thirty. I'm just trying to see if what's the one um biggest one. I oh, hope someone lives in the same street as Bring Grenya. That's amazing. Um okay, so we've got lots of people uh, recommending family connections. Well, I think I think we're um hopefully we've covered everything for you. And um yeah. Feel free. I hope the, <laughs> the sound is okay in the end. Um, lots of emotion regulation going on for me there. <laughs> um, and yeah, do the Family Connections program. Write to if you do do the Family Connections program. Write to your local minister and say local MP and say, wait, that was I did this wonderful, fantastic, free program. And why isn't the government funding this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Uh, all of our programs and webinars are actually run um, by our dedicated team of volunteer leaders and we've received no government funding. We rely on the general public to fund the entire organisation <laughs> currently. <laughs> so yes, if you have a direct line to, to uh, anyone who, any organisation who you may think um, will be able to support us, please get in touch. Um, well, I guess we'll wrap it up now. And uh, we really hope that you've all enjoyed today's presentation and gained a little bit more knowledge. I personally really loved the information about the numbing of emotions and the alexithymia. Did I say that right? Alex alexithymia, yeah. Alexithymia. Uh, and the numb one, numb them all, or um, if we can name them when we can tame them. I, I really enjoyed that part of um the presentation thank you jenny uh so thank you very much for today um and for your dedication in this space uh, for your time and to share your knowledge with us all thank you to our audience for your support um you should all give yourselves a pat on the back for showing up today for yourselves and for your families i've popped a couple of links in the chat um Thank you to those who have donated to um, this presentation already. If you have found some value, um, please do send us a little donation if you are able to. We would be very grateful. Um, and I've popped our email in the chat as well if you've got any further questions to do with our Family Connections program. But without further ado, thank you everyone and thank you, Jenny. I think I tried to stop the recording, but I think only you can do that. Correct.